Hello, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Charlie, and welcome to a charming little game called Distant Kingdoms. Special thanks to Casado Games for uh, sending me out a copy of this to share with all of you guys today. Distant Kingdoms is a colony builder. It's also sort of a social manager. Uh, it kind of takes place in a, a, a distant realm, if you will. Uh, it's been opened up by a portal. Uh, there are four races, elves, dwarves, humans, and orcs. And they met in glorious battle in the old world of Talim. And uh, unfortunately, they kind of destroyed everything. So the gods were displeased. They opened up a portal and allowed a few to come to their new oasis to build a new. And that's what you're doing. You're going to build a new home. So that's the summary, basically. Let's go ahead and launch the game. And uh, I'm going to show you guys this in free play just because the tutorial is very handholdy. It is a good tutorial, though. If you like tutorials and you're like, I don't know if you like tutorials, but if you're looking for a game that you can get into as a beginner, very easy to, to sort of learn, this is a good one. We're going to start free play, though. Now, when you start anything, you're going to choose open spaces. Or we're going to choose Windy Peaks. I think Windy Peaks, just by the looks of it, looks a lot more interesting to me. So it says the wind can be brisk up in the alpine regions of Inneron. That's the new land. Uh, Talum was the old world. So if you hear any references to Talum, that's what it is. Uh, but it's easy enough to get used to when you live in such a beautiful area. There's a surprise at every turn in these parts. So while citizens should explore every inch of this region, they should exercise caution. Who knows what lies ahead? I like it. Let's use Windy Peaks. Now, we could choose one of the four races. Let's go ahead and read them, just so you can kind of see the description. Uh, and then I'm going to choose one. They each have their own advantages, though. So they do play a little bit differently, depending on what you choose. You might want to cater to the bonuses of your race, right? So we'll just go through it. Dwarves. Some of the loveliest people you'll ever meet. You won't come across the more caring and hardworking people elsewhere. Anywhere else. Uh, family is everything to them so much that they treat pretty much everyone as family. You should see the family dinners. Highly skilled in magic and engineering, although nobody quite knows how they do it. Dwarves make excellent miners and metal workers. Their deity is Vox, god of engineering and innovation. They also have some race bonuses that give them some perks towards efficiency of your buildings. We'll talk about that in a second. Elven. The elves are a clever bunch. Science and education is their passion. Development is their goal. Be it carrying out research at the prestigious academy or teaching the younger generation, they're always seeking improvement. Don't let their dedication fool you, though. They're intelligent and can be very crafty. They make excellent politicians and physicians. They follow the teachings of, I think it's Isolus, unless it's Isolus. In any case, uh, god of progress and academia. Humans, which is what I went through with the tutorial, are sociable and happy, and as a result, they love a good party. But that doesn't stop them from working hard, however. Historically, they are farmers and merchants toiling in the fields and traveling to sell their wares to love lucky shoppers. As such, they've certainly developed an excellent sense of humor and a taste for cider. Not to worry, though. They look out for those they care about. Humans make excellent farmers and lumberjacks. They celebrate Garen, God of Fertility, and Agriculture. So as you can see, you'll probably have a little bit easier time getting population, a little bit easier time getting food, etc. right? You can kind of feel out what the advantages of each race are, kind of. Orcs are big, burly creatures, stronger than 10 men. But they're also as gentle as can be. If there's a creature or plant in need, orcs will be the first ones to assist. Their way with plants and animals makes them excellent farmers and beekeepers. They are kind and compassionate, willing to do anything to protect their fellow citizens and creatures. They worship Neri, uh, Neri. They worship Neri, goddess of love. Sorry, goddess of life and balance. So, that's not at all what I would have thought orcs were like, but it is what it is in this. Um, I'm gonna choose elves because they're just most interesting to me. Um, I'm not entirely sure their bonuses are as strong as some of the other ones, uh, at least in the early game. But I think because of their magic, their academia, right, their science and stuff, I think the later game stuff might I might be able to cater to their bonuses a little bit more. So let's go ahead and launch the game and see what we're getting ourselves into, huh? Okay, so it's popped us down right here in this open plane area. I'm gonna go ahead and pause it. Now, this is currently 
our very beautiful map that we're going to be working with. And uh, you can see we even have some ruins and stuff in here. Very interesting. We're going to check out these things, too. There's some RPG role-playing sorts of elements in this, too. If you're somebody who plays Dungeons & Dragons, for example, there's a little bit of that in this game. Just a little bit. But I want to also take a note at like some of the detail work they've done with like the different models and stuff. You see all these trees and you're thinking, okay, they're just a bunch of trees. But if you zoom right in on these things, like these are high detailed trees. All right. Like, oh my God, they actually did. I'm just saying, okay, I'm done geeking out. Let's talk about the game a little bit. So this is a sort of a, a colony builder, right? Like anything else. And uh, that means we need to cater to the lives of our citizens. We've got this little realm overview here. There's got this little camp here. And this is where most of our immigrants are starting, right? Now, sort of our portal to the world, if you will, we can start making our colony out in this way. We've got several different resources we're going to have to gather. Wood, of course, to build buildings. We have a little pile of stone right here. That's nice. And then we have also got these berries and stuff too. The first building we should be, be, be building is a warehouse. This sort of establishes where the center of our logistics is going to be found. So the warehouse has this big old circle in it. Basically, any building in the circle that's a building that this warehouse can cater to. So we're going to want to pop this thing kind of in the middle of where all of our resources are. We've got wood, stone, and here's some food, and here's some people. So I'm thinking maybe we start, I don't know, maybe right here. It's kind of in the middle, right? So we can go ahead and do something like, say, that. All right, that's our warehouse. Now, the very first warehouse will just build itself. But afterwards, we're going to need to provide roads and stuff for all this, uh, for all these people to move in, right? Warehouses will have something called couriers, okay? These are sort of your employees that are going to be moving product around. These are your logistics centers, right? Your supply chain starts and ends with couriers. So, well, okay, it doesn't start and end with couriers. The middle part is the couriers. The start and the end is, you get it, okay. In any case, we're gonna want to have a couple of houses to start things off with. And I think I'm gonna set up the houses right around this encampment so uh these are our simple house and i'm gonna put this i think is this okay that's that's pathable so why don't we put you here here and we're gonna run out of money if we don't watch it now this is actually a path right there right so i can't put this right up against it but that's okay because i kind of wanted to leave a space to put a road through so i can have a road pass through here so that will just serve as that so i'm gonna go about like this and like this. Those will be my four houses I'm going to start out with. We're going to give a dirt road all the way through here and here. And dirt roads cost something. It's not free. It's one crescent per tile. Crescent is our... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and unpause it. Get that out of way. Crescent is our currency, okay? Now, how we make money in the game to facilitate additional buildings is we need to have tax-paying citizens. And I'm actually going to go ahead and... Uh, get that started we need a road so that the couriers can go over and do it all right so when you build a warehouse it starts with some basic resources inside it 40 wood 80 water and 25 berries but that's not going to last you guys very long what we get in the house are peasants now there's a caste system if you will they call it something else i forget but um basically there is a caste system in the game peasants are like your lowest uh people they don't pay you as much taxes However, oh, we don't worry about you, Emma. Get out of here. They don't pay as much taxes. However, they also have very little needs. In this case, they want berries, water, and bread. If we could provide them with berries and bread with some water, they will be super happy. And as long as we keep them happy, population will grow. Our needs for more people will be sustained, right? So uh, that's how that works. There's four resources. Crescents is your money. And you get that by taxpaying citizens. There's mana, which we'll look at later. Then there's the happiness. Very good. If, if you have too low of happiness, people will start leaving you. If you have too, if you have really high happiness, you'll start getting more immigration. All right. So it's a it's a factor of immigration and emigration. Okay. Now the second, the next thing we're gonna need is a marketplace. Marketplace is where everybody goes to get their needs filled. So they're not just gonna walk to the warehouse. They're gonna walk to the marketplace. So I'm going to put this right here because I want room to expand on this side. So
So with the marketplace in, in place, this stuff will get delivered there. And uh, then these guys can go and shop there when they need their when they have their needs, okay? Now, I want to take a quick look. See, 51% happiness, and we have eight total residents, right? Each one of these houses can hold two people. A house costs 30. And I'm going to put another one. Let's put it on this side, like right here. Mm, one more. That's good. A house costs 30. But when they get in the house, they'll start paying you crescents. So they're going to pay me four per month, if you will. If I hover over top of this, we'll be able to see sort of what my income and expenses are. In this case, I spent a lot last month, but that's because I'm building things. What I really focused on is crescent spent on building maintenance. So right now I'm making 16 and I'm spending 10. That means I'm profitable. I need to make sure that I'm always in the green on that. Or at least if I do dip in the red, it's for a very good reason and a very temporary reason. All right, so the next thing we wanna look at is the tech tree. Go ahead and here to the technology and unlockables. And the first thing in the tech tree is this resource working. It's gonna let us build our lumber yard, our water well, and our gathering hut, which allows us to gather these resources, which is the basic needs for our citizens. So we should go ahead and do that. First, we set the focus. That's gonna bring it up as a quest up here. Now, as long as, you, as, long as we satisfy these conditions, we'll be able to have that research. So as soon as we hear the sound, nice. That means we've satisfied the conditions, all three check marks. We can come over to this and we simply say unlock and done. We have access to these buildings now. There's no time invested in somebody doing research and a progress bar and all that stuff. If you satisfy the requirements, you get it, okay? So we have three new trees that have unlocked. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look for, I think, Hmm. I think not denser housing yet. I think we go for crop farming next. Uh, it's going to allow us to get grain and work, start working with grain and stuff and eventually get the bakery and all that stuff. Uh, and that is what we need in order to keep our citizens 100% happy. Because remember, they have basic needs. That's the berries, the water, and the bread. But we have no way of giving them bread. But right now, we just unlocked the gathering hut. So actually, we do have a way of getting them berries. So let's take a look at the gathering hut. The blue area is the area in which uh, everybody is going to be working. And we're going to rotate it. We've got to put it in the middle of all of these berries. Uh, the reason for that is because we can plant them and kind of instantly spawn berries, but it costs us money to do that. If we can build this right away in a place where berries already exist, well, then we don't have to pay for it. I like that. So I think for the sake of having this a little bit closer... Uh, I'm going to put it right here in the middle. Oh, I can't. I need more crescents to do that. I also need more wood. So let me take a quick second. So 30 crescents, um, but we are making money. Yeah, we're making, we're 10. All right, 10, 10 a day or something like that. 10 a month, I think is what it is. So uh, first I need a lumber yard, I guess. And I'm going to speed up time really quick to see if I can just collect those taxes. There's another thing I can do too, actually. And I'll do that first so that I can have it snowball. So what we can do is we can paint, call it quarters. But we can basically paint the ground, if you will. Set up districts in a way. Uh, so you can basically set up these districts and then you can have special rules apply to those districts. So in my case, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have people living here. I'm just gonna go ahead and go about like that for a district going to call, be called Echo Grove. And then we'll select that district, and I'm going to set up a couple of rules for this. First thing I'm going to do is festivities. Now, this reduces the efficiency of any building working in here, but since this is going to be a residential area, there's not really a whole lot for efficiency where you need to worry about. So I'm going to unlock festivities for this. Makes everybody happy, makes people less productive in the area. Um, then, because I've raised their happiness here, I can also then institute high taxation. Now this will reduce their happiness by more than I'm increasing it, but I've offset it because I'm also going to get 20% more taxes. So now we have a net decrease to their happiness, but I don't think it's going to necessarily matter right now because we're about to provide for all of their needs anyway. And in the early game, I need money to expand. So we're going to raise those taxes, but we're going to provide a party while we do it. Okay, so now we're going to collect 
uh, 25, and we're going to spend 10. It looks like uh, maybe 11. I don't know. But there we go. We're making a lot more money now. So what I want to do is I want to build a lumber yard. Once again, doing this in an area where there's already trees is in the interim anyway, in the short period, uh, it's better. So I'm actually going to build it right over here. It's closer to the warehouse. Like this, that'd work. All right. And we just need the road to connect it. There we go. And then finally, we have our berries. We need to build that. And uh, we're at 26 now, so let's keep it going a little bit. Your citizens can kind of get by on the supply that comes with the warehouse, but it is going to dwindle fast. So we will need to do something about that soon. And 44. Gathering hut costs 50. There it is. Let's pause it really quick. And I'm going to stick this right here. All right. Now I want to go ahead and make a road straight. Oh, I can't. Now, I'm wondering if this road is going to mess with these, but it doesn't matter. We're going to keep regrowing them anyway. And you might think, well, this is really far away for just some berries when you could pay for it. And that's true. We could put it closer and then just pay for it. However, we're also going to be doing agriculture. And there's a lot of room here for agriculture now, too. So let's go ahead and get the road put in with our new taxes. We need to wait for us to actually make the money. There we go. So now we can also go ahead and get our gathering hut. Now, employees are basically added to each of these workspaces automatically. The efficiency of the building will govern how quickly it makes product. And the efficiency building goes up when you have a full workforce on the building. There's various other things we can do in the future for that. But if we take a look at jobs, we can see there are three elven workers. Now, there's also a proficiency that we can set. If we do that, we have the four races, and we can set it as a proficiency for our race, because eventually our civilization can have many different races working in it. And we can go ahead and set workers that are more proficient at a certain building to the race that's more proficient with that building. For example, mining stone might be a good idea to have elven people, or sorry, dwarven people working there. Um, things like farming, it might be a better idea not to have elves do that, but instead have humans or orcs do that. So little things like that are things we can tweak later. But right now, we are all about the elves. Yes, so far, anyway. Okay, so the next task we need for crop farming to be unlocked is eight houses, it says. Well, they're 30 bucks a piece, and it adds to my, uh, my coffers that I need for my taxes and stuff. So let's go ahead and just add two new houses. And uh, if I can, I might even add two more if I can just collect the taxes for it. But now we have their somewhat basic needs satisfied, right? 53% happiness, okay? If we can provide them with bread, then they'll be very happy, and we can go ahead and charge them even more if we want to. Uh, I don't know if there's a way to do that, actually, but I'm kind of hoping there is, because I'm a capitalist pig, as some people would say. So there's this, and uh, let's go ahead and extend this road just a little bit. And I was going to connect this, because it would look clean, but there's really no reason to do that because there's no reason for the lumberjacks to ever go this way. And there's no reason for these people to ever go towards the lumberjacks, unless of course getting to work. But I haven't really noticed that being a thing, people going to work and then walking back home. And then I haven't really noticed that being a big deal. I mean, I'm sure they do. There are some people that are just hanging out in here. So I'm sure they do that, but yeah, we'll probably connect it. We'll probably connect it later, but not right here, though, because I want to put more houses down. So uh, actually, we can do it like this. Yeah, we'll do it like this. I just have to wait for I have plenty of wood. I just need to wait for the money to roll in. And then we can connect these two roads up. So almost 20. And come on now. Give me those taxes. So close. Actually, I really don't need this. The research is already done. Well, too bad. We're going to do it anyway. And then let's go ahead and get that road. Oh, I can't. I can go like that, though. That's enough to get it built. There we go. Okay, so we got all the houses in, at least for now. It's not for naught, though, because eventually our research is going to demand more houses, and we will already meet those requirements. So crop farming is done. Let's go to the tech tree and hit unlock. 
Now we can start building crops and stuff. I like it. Building farms and stuff. Let's go ahead and get mining started too. And we have almost every requirement except for the water well. So we probably need water. That's a pretty important thing. People are going to start getting really thirsty and leaving. So let's get... Uh, is it here? It's not in decoration. Oh, it's right here. Okay. I'm going to put this right next to the market, I think. Yes. As soon as I'm able to. My money. Oh. It's okay. Like, you... you I, I'm going to have very little money for a little while, but it's just because I spend it immediately. Money's only purpose is to spend it. So, as long as I'm not hoarding it, I'm efficiently using it, right? That's how I see it, anyway. Uh, Crescent, so 28, almost. We're going to get to 40, and then we're going to start looking at... Uh, agriculture. Meeting those needs. Okay, we'll drop that down right there. It's got a nifty little soundtrack to the game, too. It's There's a couple of songs that I like more than others, but... This one's kind of, it's very pleasant. I don't know. I can chill to this, you know? All right, mining is done, we'll unlock it. Now, as we continue to advance to more and more advanced things, we're gonna need stone a lot more. So the stone supply is gonna become pretty critical for us. And um, to get more immigration, all these houses are full, right? They should be. I probably should start hoarding money because we might start running out of berries pretty soon. If we run out of berries here, what we can do is try planting. Attempts to plant as many resources as there is space for up to a maximum cost of 34. So it's gonna cost a little bit more for us to do it. Um, we have to pay for it, but once we do it, there'll be more in the area. I'm gonna wait until they need it. Because in the meantime, I can spend that money on something else like farms, for example. So, actually, stone mining probably too, but let's get a crop farm first if we can. It takes 90 crescents to do that. So, I think we should expand our population. And I'm going to go like this. At least like that. Connect that with a road there. And, you know, it might have been better to move... It might have been better to shift this out just to line it all up with this thing, but I think I have a plan for this little area. Yeah. If I expand this road over here, this should be enough room, I think, for another house. So we can have two more houses here. And then we have this little area with like two like two tiles worth, and we could maybe do something in there. There's a lot of decorations and stuff too. So if you look through here. We have all these different allotments and decorations and things we can put in. I have no idea if these actually do anything. I haven't seen any indication that they do anything in terms of like making people happy, but I would hope that they do. Like a beauty like a beauty score in the area or something. But again, I haven't noticed that. I haven't seen that. We're gonna build one more house and I'm gonna do it, I think right next to this one. And then just make this little path right there. Okay, let me let this run really quick, build up some wealth, and then we'll start crop farming. I'll be right back. Okay, so I have a little bit of money now, about 200 bucks. Um, I went ahead and I regrew this and this because I needed to, but once we deplete this, I'll show you guys how that works again. It, it basically, you pay the money and all of a sudden these things just grow out of the ground instantly. So you'll get more and more if you do that. All right, so. Uh, I, went ahead also, I went ahead also in the technology tree, and I clicked here and started baking. So this will unlock the windmill, the bakery, and ultimately allow us to make bread, which will satisfy these people a lot more. And we need to do that, because right now our happiness is only 51%. Now our capacity for people is higher than the number of the citizens we have, right? Which means our houses are not really getting full full, and that's because people aren't that happy. So we need to increase their happiness. I'm gonna go back into the district now that I've benefited from some taxation stuff. And I'm gonna go ahead and just bring that offline. And this will make them even happier. So now their happiness is going up 77% now. And as a result, our population is instantly growing more, which is what we need for the next goal for baking. We need 22, uh, actually we need 30, um, but we also need to build a crop farm. And now we have enough money to do that. So let's go ahead and build one. 
I'm gonna go ahead and click the farm and we're gonna get this area and this is how much area I'm allowed to farm in this but I'm not allowed to have that many crops so I'm gonna actually kind of go a little bit actually right up against this would be more efficient because then it's this is where we actually have the stuff so I'm gonna put it here and then I'm gonna go ahead and farm the fields in the back here although I may not have left myself enough room mm. I may end up farming this we'll see all right, so this is our crop farm. We're gonna click this. We can see our options of farming. Right now, barley is locked. We need beer and whiskey. So we ultimately need to do more research to get to barley. But for now, we can grow grain. I'm gonna click this. It costs a five, five crescents to start the field. And this is the size of it. And we're allowed to have six of these at most for this field. So I can actually put, probably put one, two, Let's say three on this side, and then how about we go hmm, right along that road actually is cool. Hmm, yeah, I kind of like that. We go one, two, three. I can dig that. And this leaves me room for other buildings and stuff here next to this. So I'm good with that. So now we have six of these. Now, the reason I dropped six is because our production is indicative on how much we're produce, how much we're growing. So if I, I can choose to drop less than six if I want to, but if I drop six, well, then I get the full load of it, right? And this is good because I can also put the wind, maybe the windmill and the bakery and stuff here uh, later on. I forget how big the windmill and stuff is, but in any case, I also want to get a stone mine going. Oh, and that was supposed to go here with a road. So now we're going to go up this side with it, which I guess isn't that big of a deal, but we're going to go around like that with the road. So what we're going to do is with a stone mine, we're going to put this right here, connect stone up to our road network like that. And now we're going to connect stone and we'll start, you know, gathering that. So if we increase our residents to 30, we unlock baking and then we can really start getting our population up because we'll be satisfying happiness entirely. So let's get uh, more houses. I'm tempted to put them all right in this little area. Kind of want to. Hmm, yes, I think so. We're gonna go one, two, three, four houses here. And we're gonna leave this little gap because I can use this space too. And I'll show you once we get there. I don't I don't know when we're going to get there. But you'll see. I can use this space. It's not going to be wasted. All right. So we've added the houses. And just like that, we have more residents. So let's go ahead and unlock baking. All right. The next thing to unlock in the tech tree is denser houses. And uh, we already satisfy this. So if I hit set focus, I can instantly unlock it if I choose to. So there we go. The next thing we can do is magic. Yes, ah, oh, the mana well. Let's set focus to that, and we'll start. We'll start looking at that in a second. Before we do that, though, let's make everybody happy by getting some bread. So I want to get a windmill, and it is just oh, it's just just too big, guys. Oh, that's that feels bad. Can I move? Hmm, I don't think I can move them per se, but I do get refunded for the field, so I can actually move them. I can simply delete these fields and then place them one back like this. And I get pretty much refunded the entire cost. So that works for me. I'm all right with that. Um, let's go with windmill right next to it. Yep. And um, we're going to go like that. Now we're running low on crescents, boss. I know. Don't worry. It's for a good cause. Uh, the next thing we'll do is bakery. We don't have enough stone for that. Which is why we are now gathering stone. Of course, the windmill, I think, also takes stone. Yeah, it does. So right now, you can see if I click this, it'll show me kind of where it's getting its source. Right now, the stone is being sent directly from the... Uh, I believe it's what it is. Is it getting sent? Okay, kind of. It's not being sent directly from the mine to here, but it's being sent to here, and then it's immediately hauled out of there. So it's kind of the same because it's along the same road. I could also maybe take a road like that if I wanted to, but mm, I don't need to yet. All right. So you're noticing we got this little icon here. 
And this is telling me that this building is not being fully worked. So if I look at this, there's only four out of five employees here, which means we need more people. Now, luckily, we've unlocked the ability to have our houses hold more people. So if I take a look at my peasant house, I don't have... Oh, there it is. Now I have the stone. So what I can do with this house is I can spend 50 crescents, also give it 25 wood and 5 stone, and the modeling changes, and it now allows two more people inside this residence, right? And I can do that for basically every single house that's here. I want to go ahead and paint really quick. Quarters, paint. Let's extend my little zone here to cover these guys. Kind of like that, I suppose. And then we want to kind of get rid of it. We don't we don't need it to be everywhere. So maybe we just kind of go, I don't know, something like that for now. All right. So these guys, right, they're, they're happier over there. Now, another thing we could do is we could paint our production buildings if I wanted to. So I could go like, say like this, paint a new region or a new zone. We can go like this. And this is Bright Estate, right? And with Bright Estate, maybe in here, I want people to have more overtime. Probably not. Sanitation focus, less chance of illness. Haven't had to deal with illness yet. They didn't do that in the tutorial. Same thing with crime. They didn't cover that in the tutorial. And also fire safety. They never covered fires. But apparently that's a thing. Yeah, yeah. Let's just delete this for now. I don't want to mess that up at all. Oh, see over here? I'm getting a little short on trees. So if I wanted to, I could pay 40 and trees will just grow. Yeah. Usually it's better to do that when they're really dead. Like there's nothing there, but yeah, is what it is. Because they're gonna grow supply in their area up to the amount that you have, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna get like a, a huge lush forest around this thing. I kind of wish, and we can do auto regrow. We just have to have dedicated planters technology. So you don't have to do them yourself over and over again. We can also apply some upgrades to buildings. So lubricated gears, for example, would give us more efficiency, but it would also increase the maintenance of the building. So if we need a lot more lumber, this might be worth it. Since the maintenance of this building right now is six, and it's gonna increase the maintenance by three, Actually, it might be better just to build another lumber yard. The only down, the only downside for that though, is that now you have more people. So, eh, kind of depends on your situation, I suppose. We don't have enough people working the stone mine either. So mostly it's just a population thing right now. We have 80% happiness. So why don't we upgrade a couple more houses? See if we can get some more people living in here. And we'll upload the upgrade the ones that are kind of closest to the marketplace for now. If we can get more people living here, hopefully that means we get more of this. So now I need bakery. Put this right. Ooh, I could put this right here actually. I could I could dig it in, but I still have a spot. I still have a use for this area. I think. I'm hoping it's not too narrow. I'm really hoping that's not too narrow. We'll see. All right, there's the bakery. And as soon as the bakery begins to actually make bread, we'll start seeing our happiness. Like this is gonna shoot to 100 because we'll start providing that thing that they're missing, right? And when that happens, we're gonna start uh, seeing all these buildings being worked all the time. In the meantime though, I need to start upgrading houses as much as I can as soon as I get the materials to do so. So I'm gonna sit here just for a second I'm going to let us kind of do a little bit. Let us kind of get that bread worked up. You can already see the happiness is rising. People are happy that we have bread now, finally. And uh, as this number goes up, this number begins to go up higher, too. We just need to increase our residence to 50 before we can start working with magic. And that's going to be awesome. I can't wait to show you magic. Okay. So, because it's like a unique thing. You don't normally see, you know, magic 
being utilized and stuff in city builder games like this but they found an interesting way to do it and i don't even know the half of it yet i just know the very basic beginner way of doing it so we'll see how that works uh in the more later game too so magic is unlocked actually so let's go ahead and do this and unlock okay the next thing in the tech tree then is going to be exploration which is also a pretty cool thing and uh, this is where you start getting into the quests and those RPG elements I was referring to before. So exploration here, required residence is 60. We'll set our focus to get the tavern. And we just want to upgrade these houses until, well, until we can get to 60 if possible. Don't quite have it yet. It's getting close. We're losing crescents. There's our 100% happiness. Everyone loves the bread. Thank you, thank you, oh gods in the sky, for providing us with bread. He gave us our daily bread. <laughs> I pulled it in eventually, didn't I? I didn't miss that opportunity all the way. I'm going to extend this road and probably start building some things out here, too. All right, I've increased our population above 60. I dropped in a bunch more houses right here, and I extended this road up and over so that this whole neighborhood can be connected. Um, and then I might actually go ahead and just do this. It's a little bit of extra cash, but I think it might be worth it. We'll just connect these roads up like this too. Um, these, these houses here are already on this road. And also the district, uh, the quarter, needs to be extended just a little bit. Take advantage of that happiness bump a little bit like that. Should do it. I'm also gonna erase the market from that district. And uh, I've also omitted the bakery from this district too because there's an efficiency decrease uh, inside the district or inside the quarter, I guess you could call it. All right, now the one thing I'm a little bit confused about, to be honest, is that our population has almost doubled since I built these buildings and yet they're still at less than ideal employee. And I don't know exactly why that is, but I'm gonna place a proficiency on this building. And uh, it says no race has been encouraged to to work here, I guess. So human increases the efficiency by 20% if we wanted to do that. Um, but there's not really any additional bonuses unless you have humans. So I guess there's no point to do that. Um, if we look at the farm over here, there's no proficiency bonus here either. And it looks to me like humans get uh, another efficiency bonus as well as reducing the chance for fire. So on these types of buildings, you know, it's, it's better to have humans for these, right? Regrow cost is lower. And actually, we're getting uh, close to needing that, too. For stones, job proficiencies, dwarven, you know, they increase it. So what are elves good at? <laughs> elves? Well, they're going to be better at magic. And I almost have enough stone to build this mana well. So I'd like to get that going pretty quick here. If I can just get three more stone in storage. Pretty, pretty, please. Come on, you can do it. There it is. All right. So the mana well, I'm going to place in this little spot right here for now. It fits nicely in this little area, doesn't it? We're going to put that right there. And the mana well, they, they work here. Just like any other building, they'll work here. And they'll create and generate mana by doing so. So right now we have full full workload here. 40% efficiency. If I go to jobs, Elvin has a proficiency and we can get 40%, which is what we have. We have an Elvin proficiency on this. So we're gonna have basically 140%. And that means that we're gonna be producing a lot of mana. In this case, six per week. Now, six per week is a lot for one of these things. So that 40% is huge. But what is mana used for, Charlie? Well. We're going to get to the, most of this, but to, for starters, totems are very cool. We have different totems for all sorts of different types of purposes. Uh, we have a totem of happiness, for example. It increases happiness across the board for anything inside its range. Totem of happiness. Why not put that in this little area, huh? We can just stick it in there. So I'm going to do, uh, yeah, like right here. So here's our totem of happiness. And everyone in this region can rejoice and love happiness. Huh? Now, totems consume mana. In this case, this one consumes six mana. Well, we are producing six, 
So therefore, we are now neutral. I can perform. I can have this one totem support supported by just this one mana well and increase happiness for everybody for that. But I want to do even cooler things with this mana. Yes, of course I do. I want to have portals. Create a portal and connect different areas. Yes, that's right. You can build a portal, for example, if I want to build one here and build one over here, let's say, and that allows instantaneous travel from here to here. As long as you have the mana to support powering it. Huh? Kind of cool, right? So this right here now looks like we're only using four, okay? What you can do is you can set stability for this. The more stable the totem is, the greater its effects, but also the greater the cost of operating it. I don't really need a huge thing here because everyone's kind of happy. I'm going to set this to target just to one. Now, it still has a base consumption of two, and this is where it really is now. But it's really only increasing happiness by 1%, so I don't, want to, I don't really want it to use a whole lot of mana. But here's the thing. What I can also do is add another totem, and this one can be of... It's the Foreman. Totem of the Foreman increases efficiency of all the buildings in its area. So let's say I want more efficient lumber and stone, or maybe I want all of these buildings to be more efficient. Maybe I can get this to have all three of these. Ooh, it'd be cool if I can get all three of these. I think that, I don't think that covers it. I can try this. I can, I can try that. Eee, that's close. It, I'm not sure if that covers or not. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it there. Totem of the Foreman, right? So I can take a look really quick here and Totem of the Foreman is affecting this for plus 10%. Totem of the Foreman is affecting this for plus 10% and it's getting this one too. Very nice. Wait, are you getting, are you getting the, oh, you're not quite getting this though. The farms would have been cool to get, but we're also getting the warehouse involved too, which is awesome because that's our logistics and stuff too. So that totem is gonna increase everything else out right now. And that's pretty cool. It does create like this little graphic effect and I kind of wish I could hide it to be honest, but it's just a nitpicky thing. I don't see a way to actually hide the effects from these buildings, but I also wanna make sure I'm not overspending mana. So six out of six, I think that's okay. Um, right now we're increasing efficiency by eight. If I lower it to level four, it will use less. Um, I wonder how it will go. Yeah, now it's only 6%. Well, 8%, 6%, 8%. What happens here is that totems will always try to achieve a level five efficiency on their own or level five stability on their own. That's their neutral point. That's their sweet spot. Totems will always try to do five unless they're told differently. So we've got uh, these basic buildings covered. That's pretty good. Our mill is, is covered. We didn't quite get this building, but I can always drop other totems if I want to. And the thing is, with the ma with magic, we can also, we can always add more of these too. You can have multiple mana wells as you expand your population. So that's pretty nice. And that's kind of a basics approach. But one last thing I want to show you before we sign off on the video today on our little preview of this wonderful, charming little game is the tavern. So let's go ahead and unlock exploration. So I want to build a tavern. I need a little bit more stone to do that. But the tavern I'm going to place, let's say right here. This is a nifty little spot for the tavern. I'm good with this. So as soon as I have enough stone to build it, we're going to go ahead and have that completed. And I think by the time they get everything delivered to it, we'll be good to go on there. All right, the tavern is built. It's a lovely looking tavern, isn't it? I think it's pretty cool. So I can click on this, and right now there's not a whole lot going on with it. But if I hit exploration, we go to the world map view. The world map view is nice. I'm gonna pause it really quick just so things are happening in the background making noise. So, and actually, if I back out a little bit, then we can get away from the town noise too. So this is where we are right now. And I love how it's kind of a live preview. You can see the little circles and everything from our totems, right? It's like a live preview of our city. But we also have these four regions that we can explore, right? Now, if I click one of them, it'll take me to that region. At least it used to. Now it's not. Oh, 
Maybe I did something different last time. It usually, oh, maybe it's because I'm paused. No, it's not doing it anymore, huh? All right, in any case, if that region over there, right, is right here. And I kind of want to see what's going on with this tunnel, all right? I want to see if there's anything to explore in there. So what I can do, I can go to the world overview. Ah, this is what happened. So in exploration, you're actually managing a party. If I just go to the world map and then click, it takes me right there. That's what it is, okay. So I want to go exploration, of course. So one more time into the breach. Now, we can set up parties. Let's go ahead and recruit a party. When you go to recruit a party, okay, you have all these different candidates that you can choose from. They're all different levels, right? They have different sets of skills that are make them that make them valuable. And a party can consist of up to four adventurers. So we have Darius Rock here, okay? And he's an orc level one. He's athletic. Great physical finesse, right? He has orcish heritage, so it just they all have their own little heritage that they're proud of and stuff, right? Um, and then courageous. So basically, the things that matter here is that he's an orc, but also athletic and courageous. Marine is intelligent. The character knows everything there is to know about anything, according to them anyway. Uh, troll tongue. They can communicate with trolls. Now that's interesting. And this one's a scholar. Deep knowledge of written languages. That seems very valuable to me. This human does. He has a lot of different skills in the mental department. So I'm going to go ahead and hire her. All right, that's one. Next, let's take a look and see if we can find some other skills that maybe she's weak at. So we can fill our party with a well-rounded party that can do things. So I'm going to look at this one's lucky. Very cool. Athletic, courageous. We don't have anyone that's athletic and courageous. But we also have somebody that's lucky. That'd be, that'd be cool. We already have a human, though. So maybe not quite going human yet. I don't think we can do this without having an elf because our base is elf. And so here's Varn Tarler. He's the only elf in our candidate roster list here. He's strong and he's also uh, he's also a scholar. So I don't know, it's kind of double dipping. Maybe our adventurers won't be elves here because it didn't really provide me with a whole lot of elves. Um, let's check out you, barbarian and arena fighter. This one's an arena fighter and lucky and she's a dwarf. I mean, I, I don't really, Lucky could become could come in handy. Maybe we take somebody who's lucky. Uh, now this one has a mana affinity, and she's also a prankster. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Is a prankster going to be useful for us? I don't know. Strong is pretty good. I think I have to go with somebody who's got lucky at least once. You never know. And athletic is very good too. So I'm actually going to take Safra here. So she's we have the courageous and athletic and the lucky thing taken care of now we, we really need our good fighters at this point i think so um we have athletic we do have athletic so i think uh ooh, detective is a pretty good one though they can discover things that otherwise we wouldn't be able to but that's the only talent this one has i don't think it's worth having one in this valuable slot that only has one talent so i'm gonna pass on that one I was hoping to find somebody with night vision right here. Low light vision. This one also has strong and is a hunter. Very diverse um, set of skills that we do not yet possess. So I'm gonna have you join the party too. And being able to see in the dark is great. And then I think the next one probably can just be anything. And I, I think I will take out Elise. She's the only one with mana affinity. And uh, this prankster thing could be kind of interesting. Maybe it comes... Uh, Maybe it's uh, useful for us later. So I'm going to go ahead and take that and hire these four. And this is going to be my party for this particular um, for this particular set, right? So my set of adventurers are going to go and explore something. And I'm not sure which one it was. Is it this one? That one looks like, yeah, this tile right here looks like it has the, the cave. But what we really want is more resources too. So we kind of going to do both of them. But I just want to see if we can go in that cave. So first I'm going to say, send on an adventure. And then I want to say, hey, we're going here. And off they go. Now, the party has a certain amount of action points that can be applied before they have to come back to the tavern. There's also their party morale. And each individual person in the party has their own individual morale, too. And that morale can fluctuate depending on the events uh, of the adventure that they go on, right? We have... Uh, the fact that they're exploring an idol or whatever. Confrontation maybe is a thing. I don't know. But they've already explored it. It looks like they're done. 
Um, they're returning to Tavern now. So nothing unique happened while they were exploring it. But the thing is, now that they've explored this, we can build on it now. See how this is accessible now? This hex is accessible because they explored it. We know it's safe. And here's an, an extra source of stone for us. So if we wanted to keep going and get more stone, we now have a source to do that. And that's how you build out additional map tiles. You do it by exploration. You set up different parties. You go on adventurers. And I really wanted to show you a quest. I was really hoping that one would pop a quest. Let's do one more just to see if we can get a quest to pop. And if not, then so be it. So let's go in into exploration one more time. And I want to say, send on an adventure. Let's go that way and see if they run into anything interesting while they're on an adventure. Now you can go back to doing what you're doing while they're on their adventure too. And uh, we can actually queue up more technology if you'd like to as well. And the next one is the citizen tier. So unlocking citizens will provide us with, with yeah, citizens. Uh, now they're a little fussier than peasants, which means they have higher needs. They want basic clothing, they want beer, they want cider, and they want whiskey, okay? But they also pay more in taxes. And this unlocks the firefighter station. So in case we have to deal with fires, we'd be able to do that. We're gonna set that as a focus. And since we already meet the criteria, we can simply unlock it. And all of these other things just became available to us, right? Coal, iron, larger warehouses, fruit farming is a thing now, beer, whiskey, and animal farming to make clothing. So there it is. We've reached the citizen tier. And now we might find fires. So we're going to want to put in a uh, firefighter station. And that takes a lot of resources. So we'll look at that. It also has 10 crescent maintenance. And you really have to watch yourself at this stage of the game you really have to watch your money because the stuff starts to get very expensive. So for example, I collected 132 last month for taxes, but I spent uh, 75 plus 28. I'm spending right just over a hundred. So I have a little bit of a profit, but it's, it's, it's dwindling. Okay. Now we have an encounter. Finally, we could end the video with the encounters to show you how this works. So the, the party has encountered a group of imps who have been following them for some time, looking for a way to cause total chaos. They find, uh, they find that way when the party happens upon a ruined house and the imps beckon them forward with evil grins. Should the party follow? Of course, let's, let's do the encounter. Okay, so the house. As the party nears the house, they can see that once it was once a grand place, perhaps the home of one of Iniron's former inhabitants. The doors and windows on the ground floor are blocked up. However, the only way in is through an upstairs window. So we have four different party members and we have two options on what we can do. However, one of those options, we have an advantage in. Athletic, we have an athletic character. So if we wanna scale the outside of the building, an athletic character might be able to do that very easily. huh? or we can investigate the surrounding area. We don't really have an illusionist, so we don't really know about that one, but we definitely have someone athletic, so let's go ahead and do that. Well done. They reach the top without incident and the others are able to follow. Huzzah! Okay, next stage. Hopefully. Uh, let's go ahead and kill this and Ah, there it is. It took a little bit of time. I wasn't I wasn't sure what happened there. Uh, so once inside the house, the party is stunned to see that the appearance of ruin on the outside was just that, an appearance. Because inside, the house is as grand and as intact as it would have been years ago. What a strange place. The party is itching to explore. We have two options. What are you waiting for? Time to explore. Somebody courageous could lead the party in there. Or, hold up, we should probably check that this place isn't booby trapped. You know what imps are like. Somebody who's perceptive might be able to find booby traps. Well, I have courageous and I have perception. So, uh, let's try the perception. Let's try that. Congratulations. Several booby traps were revealed. One right in front of the party. That was close. They head downstairs. Huzzah. <laughs> I actually like really like the huzzah thing. Let's upgrade this house and upgrade this house. And we'll just keep upgrading the houses that we can until it pops another. Uh... Ooh, we're getting low on wood. Ah, okay. Well, we don't have any wood, right? Let's pay for it. And we get trees spawning up and now we can start getting wood. 
the house. At the bottom of the stairs, the party are greeted by a variety of sounds. Scurrying little hooves can be heard around them, followed by that evil chuckle we all know so well. Where are the noises coming from? Okay, we can search carefully, or we can track them. We actually have a hunter who's pretty good at tracking things. So why don't we try to track them down and see where they are? Aha, the tracks are picked up with relative ease. They lead to a door under the stairs leading down the base to the basement. Sweet. So you see the importance of having a diverse party that has a lot of different skills. You can use them situationally when the need arises on various different things. Of course, this is our first quest. It's very close to our starting point. So chances are this one's easier than some of them. But there are dungeons to explore. There's like, the, like I said, these tunnel. I'm pretty sure this tunnel comes out like over here. Um, and this might serve as like a persistent portal, I wonder. If I send them down the tunnel, do they just come out on this side? That'd be kind of interesting, huh? Uh, I also like how I can move the map and, and do things um, in the game while this is open. So, uh, the house. Down in the basement, the party is plunged into darkness. Panic ensues until some bright spark remembers the torches in their, in their pack. With light on their side once more, they step forward and find the imps before them. <laughs> they cackle in unison, and one tells them that the door behind them is now sealed forever, unless the party can convince them to open it again. So we can either try to attack the imps, or we can try to bribe the imps into releasing the party. Now, we don't have anybody who necessarily has an advantage here, and these guys have already used their AP, so now we have Elise. She's the only one that has anything left. So... I'm not sure I want Elise to necessarily go ahead and attack people, um, but she's a master charmer, so perhaps she can bribe them. I know it says shady here, but I don't know. We'll see. Maybe we'll try the bribe. The imps accept the bribe, but they don't open the door. Did the party really think it would be that simple? You pesky imps. Okay, so they accept the bribe, and that's all they did. So it looks like we're going to have to attack them. The adventurers ran out of action points and must withdraw. A blow, to the, a blow to the morale, no doubt. Oh, disastrous. So, unfortunately, we weren't able to get all the way through it because we ran out of AP. But, never fear. They'll come back to the tavern for a quick rest, get their morale back up, and you can go right back out and do it again if you'd like to. Um, and we don't actually get access to this area until we complete that. Because as long as there's dangers here, we won't set up a settlement. So, that is how quests work in the game too. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did and you like the game, please consider uh, subscribing for one. Please consider uh, giving the video a like, comment down below, let me all know all that stuff. But if you wanna buy the game, it's available on my game store right now, link in the description. And if you buy it there, it's on a little bit of a discount for limited time. You also get, you also throw me a kickback while doing so, while getting a cool game. So anyway, that's it for me today. Thank you very much for watching and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.